Yesterday, I made a video about five bad things in the Ezio trilogy, but as we all know, for every bad thing in the Ezio trilogy, there are at least 50 good things. But I can only begin to imagine how irritating it would be if I were to list 250 good things to balance out yesterday's video. However, I will list 10 great things in the Ezio trilogy. So, here goes. Please do bear in mind that this is my opinion. First of all, I would like to talk about the Renaissance period, which is an amazing time period, really, really fitting for Assassin's Creed. It's an ideal setting for the Assassin's Creed games, and Assassin's Creed 2 and Brotherhood really proved that. Assassin's Creed Revelations sort of spun off into the Ottoman Empire a little bit, still sort of Renaissance, but it wasn't that focus. Whereas Assassin's Creed 2 and Re Brotherhood sort of had that focus on the Renaissance, and it was really, really well done. And I really liked the setting. And after Assassin's Creed 1 being set in like the 12th century, after that, well, what happened was I saw the promotional art and saw it was a few hundred years after, and I got the feeling of would this feel empty to my heart but it wasn't this was the best assassin's creed setting that there ever was in my opinion being the renaissance and honestly i fucking love it and i can't really express that enough all the bright colors and all, all it's just a beautiful period the artwork is amazing the characters the soundtrack oh it's just it's just fucking beautiful that's all i can say next up we have Ezio Auditore, the protagonist of the Ezio trilogy, obviously, hence the name. Ezio's character was very well structured and layered, and we saw development from someone out for revenge to a dedicated assassin with wisdom and skill, and we get to see him become deadlier and deadlier throughout the games. And in Assassin's Creed Revelations, he's really deadly, but really chill, and we still have his character. His character is consistent, strong, intelligent, and quite charismatic. Ezio's personal story was quite interesting, how he was out for revenge, but then it became about so much more, and it became about the Assassin Brotherhood, etc, etc. And with Ezio's personality being the cherry on top, it made the Assassin's Creed Ezio trilogy really, really worth playing. Another thing are the amazing side characters, such as Leonardo da Vinci, who's an amazing point on his own, in fairness. However, the amazing side characters in the Ezio trilogy make the game even more worth playing than just Ezio, because there are many great characters. There's Leonardo da Vinci, Machiavelli, Bartolomeo, Yusuf Tazim. There are so many great characters with interesting stories of their own who sort of follow Ezio in their journey, but Leonardo especially was really special because he had a story that was sort of running parallel to Ezio's, not in what was being done, but the fact that they were recurring at the same time and their paths kept on crossing over and stuff like that in the Ezio trilogy made the games really good because you could have these characters maturing with Ezio at the same time, for example Machiavelli in Assassin's Creed 2 and Brotherhood, and so on and so forth. Next up we have the Assassin Tombs, the Tombs of Romulus, and the Altair Tomb things in Assassin's Creed Revelations. Now these tombs were great, they were little more linear sort of sections in the games and they were done really well, they were quite diverse from one another. Where so that I really enjoyed all of these tombs because they presented different challenges to get to the end in each one. Some of them would require chases or combat, whereas others would require that you be quick and get to the thing in time before that the timer resets and it just goes back to normal or whatever. And others just require you to not die. And all in all, it's just great. I liked the reward being the armor of Altair in Assassin's Creed 2. In Assassin's Creed Brotherhood, the reward wasn't great, but doing the Romulus tombs were great. And in Assassin's Creed Revelations, it was for the Altair keys in the story. However, they were no less great because they were forced as part of the story. Whereas in the previous games, there were a nice bit of side content that you could do if you so wished. And I so wished, and I really enjoyed it. The baseline is they were just fun to do. They were definitely my favourite, or among my favourite, pieces of side content in Assassin's Creed 2 and Brotherhood, 
And there were probably my favourite parts of Revelations' main story as far as gameplay is concerned. Next up are the glyphs from Assassin's Creed 2 and Brotherhood and their cryptic meaning behind them. Now they weren't in Assassin's Creed Revelations for reasons that if you played the game you'd understand basically from the get-go. But these glyphs were essentially left behind or put in place by Subject 16 I believe. I mean I don't really pay attention, I'm really that bad when it comes to attention in games. But I, I assume that Subject 16 placed them down and he's leaving secret messages with some cryptic value to them and when you decrypt them things start to become more and more clear until in Assassin's Creed Brotherhood after you've decrypted all those you get met with a cutscene in which you're left there thinking what the fuck for a bit and only recently did you figure out that that was probably a hint to Desmond having a son and it's honestly major to the Assassin's Creed story and the fact that it's inside content means that people who just skimmed through the games will miss it which means that it takes some dedication to understand the story and just adds to the value of Assassin's Creed and its sort of secrets behind it and all that stuff and all the cryptic stuff which is something that I love about Assassin's Creed all these cryptic little messages and shit that's what I enjoy next up is the beautiful soundtrack which was amazing now I can't say much but I can give a couple samples so here we go Next up is the simple improvised weapons feature, which was originally placed as a joke, I believe. However, it's actually quite immersive, because picking up a broom and beating the shit out of someone with it is actually pretty fun. And also quite accurate, because somebody probably died with a broom bashing their skull in. Let's, let's face it, and it's honestly really enjoyable to, to beat someone to death with a fork or something. So improvised weapons are just that little feature that adds so much to the game without you even noticing it, and it's just really funny on top because it was put in as a joke, I do believe. Next up are the interesting antagonists. Now, these interesting antagonists, such as Vieri de Pazzi, who has like a childhood feud with Ezio, or Cesare Borgia, who's just somebody who wants to conquer Italy, or somebody else who played a part in the conspiracy of Ezio's family's wrongful execution. The villains in the Ezio trilogy are very different from one another. Like, you can define Francesco de Pazzi from Rodrigo Borgia, or Rodrigo and Cesare, or Arm Armet, or whatever he is called in Assassin's Creed, Revelations from Manuel Paleologus, and so on and so forth. All the, pr the antagonists, sorry, are different and just interesting, really. It's interesting. Who will Ezio take down next? Where will they be? How will they act? and how's this assassination machine going to play out sort of thing. Things like that on the first playthrough, you won't really know. And their diverse personalities as villains is also something that's very interesting. Next up we have Villa Auditore and Monteregioni as a whole. So Monteregioni, shall we say. So Monteregioni and the villa was an amazing place where you could just sort of go and chill out and upgrade the place and make it more of like a den and stuff, fortify it with better stuff such as a courtesan's den because you need that and blacksmiths, 
tailors, stuff like that, all from that guy in the room. And the more the, the place was upgraded, the more stuff got deposited in your chest, which could help you earn money quicker in the game, which was very helpful when you needed to get a high level sword or something. And it was just a nice warm feeling to have this village as your home in Assassin's Creed 2. And then it was also funny to see you get destroyed in Brother. That was definitely one of the many middle fingers in Assassin's Creed. Just saying. And finally, the Altair memories in Assassin's Creed Revelations. Now, it was really cool to go back and see Altair again. And if you don't know, because you skipped the game, which is wrong, Altair is the protagonist of the first Assassin's Creed game, and we got to see more of his story in Revelations. Specifically, more of his story after the events of Assassin's Creed 1 for, as his life from the age of 26, becoming the mentor of the Assassins, his struggles later on in life, and how he handled his power with the Apple of Eden, and his later life, basically. And it was beautiful. And the the ending was sad, but it was just amazing to see Altair again in more beautiful graphics and more of his story. And we got to know Altair a little bit better than we did at the end of Assassin's Creed 1. And all in all, it was just amazing to be able to do that. And it was one of the many things in Revelations that was great. And there you have it, everybody. Ten great things in the Ezio trilogy. Now, there are many, many more great things, and these are only the ten that I could think of at this point. I've actually got a massive list of more written down, but CBA making a video that nobody's going to watch until I'm just about halfway through. Well, if you made it this far into this video, congratulations. The code word to tell me this video is sweaty bumhole sexy assassin magic. No, yeah, yeah, that. Don't forget to leave a like, subscribe, share, comment. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you all soon. So, yes. Yeah. So, yeah.